पहले स्टार्ट किया स्टार्ट स्टार्ट Good morning ladies and gentlemen I request all of you to please settle down Welcome to the second day of the international conference on values and foreign policy interests and ideals I request all of you to kindly keep your mobile phones either switched off or in the silent mode while the conference is on uh, So we begin with the fifth session of the conference uh on western liberalism and asian values in foreign policy we have on the dais veronica sutherland as the chair and the speakers and ravi velur over to you veronica sutherland thank you good morning everybody so well, this should be an extremely interesting session picking up themes from yesterday and i think by now our three pe- three speakers are all well known to you kate sullivan destrada um specialist in south asian studies uh, associate professor and author of rising india status and power um krishnan shrinivasan who really does need no introduction and to whom we're very grateful for organizing this um or being the the inspiration behind this whole uh session uh, this whole uh two day event which is proving extremely fascinating i must say and then ravi phalo a journalist um from singapore uh straight times who has wide experience of reporting across um across asia uh and with that i will ask um kate could you could you start us off please thank you <coughs> Good morning can everyone hear me it's working excellent so um i'm delighted to be here today and to join you all at this conference we had an extremely rich and stimulating day yesterday and my uh, great thanks to ambassador shrinivasan uh, for the invitation um the title of my talk is how does western liberalism impact today on foreign affairs globally and in asia So I want to start by asking two questions. Uh what is western liberalism and how western is it? And I hope that the answers to these two questions can help us understand the impact that western liberalism has on foreign policy and uh in in Asia today. Because western liberalism is by no means a coherent set of ideas or values. And yet most would argue in the last 70 years um that we've seen the establishment and consolidation as well as the contestation of an international liberal order championed in particular by the United States and centered on western liberalism now for some the international liberal order has pursued an economics that leads to greater prosperity a strategic order that can suppress conflict between great powers and a political order that favors democratic governance Supporters of the international liberal order argue that it served the post 1945 world world well. It spread peace and prosperity. And if there are problems with an international liberal order today, they center simply on problems of leadership. Um renewed US power, resolve and engagement will permit the containment and management of any challenges including those of rising powers. who simply need to be socialized into the existing order to think about western liberalism let's look at one of its supposedly greatest success stories the united states is purportedly a pluralistic liberal market democracy that's broadly inclusive tolerant of ethnic diversity and founded on equality that equips men and women alike with equal rights 
The Western order that the US built is supposedly also characterized by these virtues, or at the very least, seeks to project and promote them. And yet, key movements and challenges within the United States today seem to be challenging the success story of Western liberalism. We see the Black Lives Matter movement, Me Too, and a disenfranchised, predominantly white working class that has grown dissatisfied with establishment politics and yet more frustrated with anxieties over growing ethnic diversity and what this means for American identity. These challenges to Western liberalism within the United States draw our attention to key, key elements of how Western liberalism works in practice. Domestic power inequalities based on class, race, and gender should lead us to look equally critically at the Western international liberal order that the US has played the primary role in building since 1945. For a great many in today's world, the contemporary international liberal order has emerged off the back of an imperialist project of US and British elites. It has consistently contributed to deep inequality between the Western architects of the order and those non-Western states who have not been their close supporters. The liberal internationalism that underpins the international liberal order has functioned as what Indajit Palmer describes as a legitimating ideology, a system of ideas, values, and practices used to embed, justify, and uphold an international status quo that benefits some and not others. Palmer argues that the international relations of elites across states and societies operate to reproduce existing patterns of power and manage or engineer change to the benefit of themselves. The Iraq war showed how the rule of law may be central to the international liberal order, but it has been significantly violated in practice to benefit narrow political and economic interests. Key regimes of global governance and the discourse around them in the West have contained implicit racial biases. It's no coincidence that in the wake of India's 1998 nuclear tests, Jaswant Singh wrote an article in Foreign Affairs entitled Beyond Nuclear Apartheid. And you need only read Cynthia Enloe's book, Bananas, Beaches and Bases, to gain powerful insights into the gendered workings of high politics, without which the entire machinery of war, diplomacy, and governance in the international liberal order would have long since collapsed. These and other failings of Western liberalism, as it's been manifested in the international liberal order, have mattered greatly and continue to matter. But the idea of the international liberal order can be challenged in three key ways today. First, the international liberal order is not solely a product of the West. It evolved through complex and comparatively understudied processes of interaction between the, the West and the so-called rest, underwritten, of course, by a significant power differential in favor of Western liberal states. Non-Western experiences and responses to the expansion of the US-led international liberal order have shaped the foreign policies of non-Western states in important ways. Non-Western states have delivered critical responses to the ways in which security has been defined and enacted by Western powers, as well as to the sites of Western power and practice um, and dominance in global institutions. They've argued that many states and societies face challenges in adapting to the demands of a global economy. The non-aligned movement, the new international economic order, the global south position on climate change <coughs> and climate, uh, global climate governance, and also the push towards the democratization of the United Nations in the wake of the first Gulf War are prominent examples, although there are many more. A focus on the practices of contestation through and by non-Western states underscores how the making and remaking of the international liberal order has been and will increasingly be a far more interactive process than is commonly assumed. Second, the international liberal order of today is by no means the only game of global governance in town. Yesterday, we discussed the ways in which the regional organization of ASEAN practices a distinctive form of cooperation centered on inclusivity, consensus building, and non-confrontational bargaining. But we're also seeing the emergence of new kinds of plurilateral arrangements, 
such as the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. Now, Anne-Marie Slaughter has uh, certainly recognized that the Paris Agreement does not contain fixed, enforceable rules, nor does it threaten sanctions for non-compliance. However, she does claim that its deficits in this regard are its greatest strengths. It's a new model for effective global governance in the 21st century. First, because its flexibility suits the complexity and shifting challenges and solutions to a global problem such as climate change. The treaty also recognizes that a diverse group of actors needs to participate in efforts against climate change. Business, philanthropy, civil society, academia, and ordinary people all have a role to play in addressing a major global challenge. So for this reason, regional organizations and plurilateral arrangements um, are proliferating, and, and in doing so, they are subtly challenging and eroding US and Western dominance. The fragmentation of global governance, as Amitav Acharya has shown, is calling into question the core values of Western liberalism. The supposedly universal ideas of nationalism, democracy, human rights, capitalism, development, and national security are being challenged, reinterpreted, rejected, and sometimes replaced. Not all good ideas come from the West. Thirdly, the pluralization of forms of global governance has not yet rendered the international liberal order irrelevant. The ambiguities of liberal internationalism are proving to be a powerful and differential resource for the expansion of new influence, particularly in Asia. Here, China is pursuing a new game of international econo economic leadership through its Belt and Road Initiative, which seeks to connect Asia with neighboring regions via large-scale infrastructure projects that some have characterized as a form of economic imperialism that gives China too much leverage over other countries, often those that are smaller and poorer. Japan, too, having flirted briefly a decade ago with a grand strategy centered on an arc of freedom and prosperity, now centers its foreign policy on the concept of the free and open Indo-Pacific. Japan's free and open Indo-Pacific also aims to promote connectivity between Asia, the Middle East, and Africa in a strategy closely related to promoting free trade, infrastructure, investment, and development. And India is now imagining and promoting a liberal space in the Indian Ocean, for India, this strategy centers primarily on political rhetoric at present, appealing to the liberal West by invoking a rules-based international order to which China, by implication, does not subscribe, and appealing to smaller vulnerable Indian ocean states via a discourse of Chinese imperialism. In short, the power of liberal internationalism as a legitimating ideology is being harnessed in new ways by these increasingly powerful states. If the liberal international order of the past 70 years has been an elitist hegemony based on classist, racial, and imperial assumptions, what is its future? How non-Western will Asian invocations of liberal internationalism become? Will they echo the structural violence of the international liberal order of the past 70 years by creating imperialistic political and economic dependencies abroad and deep inequalities between elites and others at home? Or will the narratives of exceptionalism of great Asian states and regional groupings, founded as they are on the rejection of hegemonic practices, guide the behavior of state elites as the powerful movers and shapers at home in the region and beyond? Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, it's very nice to see, see you again here today. Um, well, the, uh, this subject is really very close to uh, the questions raised in the forthcoming book. Um, the Americans talk a great deal about liberal values in foreign policy. Uh, the Europeans, other than the Nordics and the Germans and the French, rather less so. And the Asians, after uh, Jawaharlal Nehru in 1962, hardly at all. 
Now, why is that? Now, this is the question that got me thinking on this subject uh, some two or two and a half years ago. And uh, I shared uh, my interest in this with uh, uh, Frederick Erickson and James Mail and Sanjay Pulipaka. And we thought there might be uh, a subject which was worth exploring in greater detail and also resulting in a book. Now that book has been written and will come out shortly. Now the, um, as was mentioned yesterday by Peter, the um, Woodrow Wilson's 14 points was something of a watershed, but wasn't followed up, of course, uh, uh, in its near future. And um, the whole question of values in foreign policy really entered the foreign policy lexicon uh, only after the Second World War and during the Cold War. Before that, uh, Palmerston's famous doctrine about permanent interest was the accepted theory. Now, I'm going to attempt some answers to this, uh, this question of, uh, or this contrast between Western liberalism and Asian values. And I know that in the process, I'm going to upset some very close friends in this room uh, like Rajiv Bhatia and even Ravi Valur, who is on the same uh, session as I am. But what does uh, discussion mean without uh, friendly disagreements? And, uh, and why then would this conference be worth having? Uh, to revert to my question, uh, why do some countries talk a lot about liberal values in foreign policy and other countries much less so, and other countries hardly at all? This is the, this is the question. And um, one context, of course, in, in attempting to answer this, one context, of course, is colonialism. Western liberalism had several centuries of aberration during the imperial period. Uh, and the imperial period, let's not forget, uh, ended within living memory, the living memory of the youngest of the people in this room. So this period was when the West had control over power, uh, concepts, and values. And if the Jews are marked by the Holocaust, Asian nationalism definitely bears the stamp of colonial oppression. The overhang of imperialism affects the Asian perception of Western liberal values because so many Western countries were actually involved in the opening up of Asian markets. This historical experience has become a component of Asian nationalism and leads Asians to believe that the West deploys its resources to frustrate their rise. James Mail yesterday, uh, without actually using the phrase, mentioned cuius regio, eius religio. This is the principle that brought an end to the religious wars in Europe. James, I think that uh, Asians would rephrase this as cuius regio, eius regimen or even Aeus Rex. Whereas Western liberals prioritize the individual over the nation, and the EU certainly has moved to a degree of transcending national borders, Asians hold very firmly to Article 2 of the UN Charter in regard to the sanctity of state sovereignty. Regime change and color revolutions are not acceptable. For the West, the removal of an undesirable government remains on the table, even if the West is not directly affected. The default Western options are firstly sanctions, and secondly, the threat or use of force. Western liberal interventions, which was mentioned in some detail by Peter yesterday, to export values in political systems have undermined their validity 
which leads one to believe that such interventions, certainly of the humanitarian type, under the right to protect, will probably become obsolete very quickly. They have been viewed as establishing unofficial and eventually failed protectorates. German Chancellor Angela Merkel's bewailing last year that under Donald Trump, the US could not be relied upon to impose order leads one to the obvious question, whose order? The West has long believed that international cooperation can only take place through the auspices or under the auspices of benign liberal democratic models. Though, of course, they differentiate between unacceptable Democrats and acceptable dictators. Western values ever since the French Revolution have been secularized. Religion plays no part in policy and is kept at arm's length, even in the United States, which is a deeply religious country. All Asian countries, on the other hand, have a strong sense of religion, or rather the civilizational impulses flowing from religious or spiritual tradition. And therefore the liberalism of the West often appears to Asians as being opposed to or neglectful of faith. A replay of the Charlie Hebdo situation or the Pussy Riot phenomenon, namely the willful sacrilege and mocking of religious icons, would definitely not be acceptable in Asia. The unequal cultural factor remains very hard to eliminate. Asian countries, due to their traditions, history, and culture, do not necessarily share every value promoted as liberal and universal by the West. In practice, of course, as been thoroughly discussed yesterday, nations, whether in the East or the West, do not pursue normative agendas at the expense of national interest. Many of the West standards and norms are viewed in Asia as disguised attempts to protect high-cost manufacturers and access to export markets. Mark Leonard, uh, the author, um, wrote that other nations have interests but no values, and the Europeans have values and no interests. This is a very debatable proposition. Liberal values are a legitimizing pillar of Western foreign policy. The West presents itself not only as norm-observing, but norm-setting, emphasizing legal and institutional procedures for compliance. No one at the time was trying to check the rise of the United States or Europe. And the power of the markets made access to them conditional on acceptance of their values. 80% of the standards of international trade and global markets have been initiated by the West in the areas of the many areas, but let me just say in the areas of labor, governance, environment, sustainable development, and international law. The core of Eurocentrism, in other words, was in establishing rules according to the Western interest and then universalizing them. Let's remember that Russia stopped talking about a common European home when it became clear that the European Union's conception was actually to absorb Russia into its mores. There is tension between liberal universal values and local interpretations of universality. In other words, between post-modern West and pre-modern Asia. For the West, the barbarians were always at the gates to the East. They inherited assumptions of a backward East and a progressive West now have much less purchase 
in the global community than previously. To a great extent, of course, the rise of China is responsible for this. It will not be as easy for the halfway liberal societies, as Jürgen Habermas called the West, to set the world agenda now as it was 100 or even 50 years ago. The values handed down by, success, by successive resolutions, uh, sorry, beg your pardon, through successive revolutions in the West, that is the English, the American, the French, and the Russian, laid down objectives for fulfilling the ultimate goal, which was the liberty of the individual, whatever the later distortions of those ideals may have been. It is true, as Peter said yesterday, and Rajiv too, there is nothing identifiable as Asian values. Asia does not have the same political valency or discursive cohesion in all parts of the continent designated as Asia. Because of a multiplicity of religions and philosophical traditions, values are national rather than continental. Certainly, uh, as Iftika said yesterday, there is a uniform sense of identity, an identity from civilization rather than the state, a work and savings ethic, a family-oriented community, emphasis on education, which takes a very high proportion of family disposable income, respect for age and hierarchy, and the interest of society over the individual. But the relationship of these with foreign policy is tenuous and hard to define. The important distinction between Asia and the West, as was pointed out by James yesterday, is that Asia does not seek, at least for now, to articulate any universal values or to prescribe or promote them outside national borders. Liberalism, republicanism, socialism, nationalism, communism, human rights, and multilateralism were all ideas bequeathed to the world as foundational ideas by the West. And these were exported to all parts of the world through imperialism. Because recent history has been about the rise of the Western world, there is inherent resistance to the idea that other civilizational values may exist. Francis Fukuyama's much quoted prediction of the end point of mankind's ideological evolution and universalization of Western liberal democracy as the final form of human government has been mocked, but it has been internalized by the West in its practice of our size fits all. It is correct that the whole world has subscribed to the Universal Declaration and the UN Bill of Rights. But by not doing so, a nation would outcast itself from the international community, and no nation wants to commit harakiri. There cannot be equality in the world community when the West insists on the universality of its liberal norms. International law and rules-based procedures cannot be grounded without genuine multilateralism or the logic of hard power. The declining influence of the West is evident in Europe's foundational goals of peaceful settlement of disputes and free and open trade being now a direct variance with America first of Mr. Donald Trump. We live in an increasingly non-Western world when it's an illusion to claim centrality in world affairs. Our focus, in my mind, should be on a multilateral, multipolar world order with the modernization path ending in different places various spheres of influence, and diverse ways of life. 
globalization will not make political systems more liberal or democratic, and few now can believe in a universal political convergence overcoming national interest today. Democracy has its own ethnic and cultural characteristics. A more democratic Turkey or Pakistan may become more Islamist. Free elections can lead to anti-establishment figures. The community of liberal democracies never existed when it came to Asia. Let's just take the case of liberal support to India vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan. In the future, we may have a world where borders become increasingly diffuse, but cultural and civilizational variations have not creating a permanently unstable compound of heterogeneous elements. This is exactly call, what calls not for convergence, but, but for an understanding of values that motivate foreign policy. And that, uh, Madam Chairperson, is the rationale of this conference. Thank you very much. Thank you. Rabbi Kapoor, uh, please. Thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you, Ambassador uh, Srinivasan and uh, Sanjay, for inviting me here. It's nice to be back in Delhi and uh, amongst friends. Uh, and uh, let me just uh, say that while I'm making these remarks, I'm fairly conscious that I'm one of the few people who doesn't have ambassador or doctor in front of my name. Um, uh, well, there's Shakti here too, but uh, he's more of a doctor than anybody else I know in this uh, city. Um, so, uh, many of the remarks uh, I'm going to make uh, uh, in the next 10, 15 minutes are uh, born of my uh, training and the practice of journalism and the uh, sense of skepticism uh, that we try to build in ourselves. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I say I'm, I'm a skeptic, but never a cynic. So. Uh, there's a mild distinction there, but uh, I'm, I'm proud to say that I'm, uh, I'm a skeptic uh, on many issues. <clears throat> so, uh, while coming to this question of uh, Asian values, let me sketch out my thoughts with a quick look uh, at the situation in post-war, post-colonial Asia. <clears throat> Since 1945, uh, we all heard of the last uh, two days, you know, how the continent was divided between uh, groups uh, pro-US, uh, the Soviet camp, and the non-aligned camp of which uh, India was a star. And of course, the fourth group that rose in the 80s and 90s, uh, that grew first on the strength of uh, the flying geese model of the Japanese uh, uh, capitalist waves, capital, then Western capital, including European capital, uh, that were resistant to the Western commitments to democracy, human rights, and a free media. Uh, and these are the ones that came to be associated with the so-called uh, Asian values uh, uh, debate. Now, these four clusters form uh, a span of very vast uh, geographical area. So I focus my remarks here largely around the big population centers and Japan. Now, given that India, China, Indonesia, these are the three big population centers, one, I mean, they, they all won independence or had their revolutions within the f four years after the Second World War, uh, an examination of the values they bring to foreign policy is best examined in their record as free nations. It also happens that for the first time, all these nations, including Japan, which is changing swiftly as we speak, are all led by men who were born in the post-war, post-colonial era. Chief. So this has a significant impact on the values they bring to their work. And uh, in a sense, this liberates them from carrying the burden of direct memory endured by the founding fathers, based on which some of the values and principles were derived from. And this, I would say, provides significant room for improvisation in policy. Now, the Founding Fathers left behind principal directions, but uh, 
Asia's modern history is to a large extent about nations adapting their values to contemporary realities, often in contravention of the guiding principles of state policy. Now, this elasticity is born out of circumstance and has many triggers. But when you boil it down, it invariably comes up against two values, ambition and insecurity. Now, let's take Nehru, who probably no Asian public figure had such an optimistic vision for Asia. But his statesmanship and values confronted difficult challenges right from the beginning. We have Ambassador Raghavan here in the room. If you read his book, The People Next Door, he's talking about 1947, a few months after the partition. The cabinet is saying that we will not release 550 million rupees that are due to Pakistan because of what Pakistan is doing in, uh, in Kashmir. And it takes Mahatma Gandhi's fast to death. I mean, he fasted for five days before the cabinet relented and released the money. And the Mahatma paid with his life for that. Now, the very next year, we see India intervening in, in Burma when it uh, sends a plane load of arms uh, to uh, uh, save UNU from uh, Karin rebels that had encircled Rangoon uh, Airport. Now, his daughter, Indira Gandhi, took this many steps forward. Uh, Iftikhar Saab uh, would not be sitting here as a representative of Bangladesh if it were not for uh, Mrs. Gandhi and uh, the Indian in intervention in East Pakistan. Uh, in the process of uh, splitting Pakistan, she even turned non-aligned India for a period into what many would call a virtual Soviet ally. So these examples dot history, you know, the annexation of Sikkim in 1975, and then the worst of all, the Indian intervention in Sri Lanka, based largely because of the insecurity that uh, India felt uh, about the different value systems that uh, Jayavardhane was taking uh, Sri Lanka into. I mean, if you, I don't want to make uh, a, a judgment call on whether it was valid or not, but maybe it is, she had good reasons. She had a hostile Pakistan and hostile China. She didn't want a hostile southern front. She just couldn't afford it. But nevertheless, you cannot deny the, that uh, these were probably not part of uh, what the founding fathers had imagined Indian foreign policy to be. Let me come to China, uh, which coined the five principles of uh, peaceful coexistence after Mao drove Chiang Kai-shek to Taiwan. Uh, these principles resonated around the world including Asia, and I mean, uh, particularly Asia, uh, the Indian punch seal also was derived largely from that. But a key element of the five principles was non-interference in each other's internal affairs. But even Mao's China interfered all over Asia. We know in Southeast Asia that Chin Peng, the uh, communist revolutionary from, uh, uh, from the Mal Malaya, used to broadcast hostile propaganda to Southeast Asia until 1980 when Lee Kuan Yew met uh, Deng Xiaoping. Today's China under Xi Jinping is a totally different animal. So inconsistency of the application of values is endemic to foreign policy. Uh, look at China, for instance. If you look at the way it settled its land borders, 12 out of 14 land borders were settled on fairly generous terms with the other side. But when it comes to the South China Sea on the southern front, what we have is a totally different story. Uh, in 1974, when the U.S. was distracted with the Watergate and everything else, it took the parasols from South Vietnam. South Vietnam asked for the U.S. help. It was not coming. In 1995, the Chinese moved into Mischief Reef in the Spratlys, and they did it three years after the Americans vacated Clark Air Base in Subic. Now, you can say that, uh, in a sense, this is born out of some value or the other. Uh, you know, China, uh, a lot of Western thinking, you know, there's the sense of destiny and all that. In China, uh, luck is, uh, is a key value. And they know that luck comes and goes, and it's fleeting, and you have to grab it when it's passing you by. Otherwise, you may have lost the opportunity. And maybe this was a manifestation of that. But it also shows opportunism and 
you know, and, and maybe they had good reasons that uh, they felt they needed to uh, protect the southern flank. But the fact is that this was a very friendly administration in the Philippines under Fidel Ramos, but they nevertheless went in and picked it up. And the first explanation when the Filipinos asked was, oh, you know, these are just uh, a place for uh, our fishermen to dry their nets. But today you have a full-fledged military base in, uh, in the Spatulis, in Mischief Reef. So you can, you know, these examples abound across Asia. Again, if you look at the Chinese self-image, it is that of being a model international citizen that follows the rules. And it does follow the rules when it suits it. If you look at how it's mastered the WTO dispute settlement mechanism, initially they took Indian help to understand how to play the WTO. When they learned it, they became very good at it. But when it came to the ruling on the South China Sea from The Hague, they just said, look, it just doesn't apply to us. Totally ignored it. Let me talk about Japan, which is the only nation that's uh, been attacked with nuclear weapons. It has a pacifist constitution written by the Americans for it. Today, Japan is involved in a steady rearrangement of its values. It is still overwhelmingly pacifist, but it is steadily moving to have a more normal military. The self-defense agency has been renamed. Today, they have a proper ministry of defense. Uh, the, the, the rules have been tweaked. Japanese uh, troops can now fight abroad in the aid of an ally. Uh, in November, people here might have read that the Izumo-class uh, helicopter carrier, they call it a destroyer, came all the way down to Sri Lanka. And uh, uh, two, about six weeks ago, they announced that uh, these destroyers are going to be uh, redone, the sense that uh, their, their deck is going to be strengthened to take fighter planes, which is the F-35. Uh, so Japan is changing. And if you, you know, two years ago, there was this uh, uh, instance when there was a live firing exercise on the foothills of Mount Fuji, and nearly 30,000 Japanese uh, came to attend, and many of them were murmuring appreciatively. So values and principles cannot be ignored, uh, but when it comes to national interest, countries do behave in a way that suits them. Again, uh, on Japan, let me quote you from Ambassador Shamsaran's uh, book. This is in relation to the 2008 visit he made as a special envoy uh, to enlist uh, Japanese help uh, for the NSG waiver. And he talks about meeting Taro Aso, the foreign minister, and Aso reads from a long paper, uh, basically setting out the Japanese position and saying, you know, how the Japanese people are against uh, uh, nuclear arms. And uh, then he walks Sham Saran to the lift, and along the way he says, look, We'll make a lot of noise, but at the end, we'll do nothing. Go ahead. And I'm telling you this because I have Abe's instructions to tell you this, that we will not stand in the way of your NSG wave. So time and again, we see that values and principles are generally deployed only as long as they serve the national interests. In other words, they tend to be tactical many a time. Now, what about Asian values as such? As, as a concept, it is true that a quarter century ago, some people like Mahathir, Mohammed in Malaysia, Lee Kuan Yew, stressed that Asians, uh, particularly those in Northeast Asia and the Confucian-influenced societies, tended to emphasize the community over the individual. <clears throat> but in many cases, it was uh, a fig leaf that they provided to help others out. Indonesia was an occupation of East Timor from 1975 to 1999. The Tiananmen Square incident of 1989, June 4, as they call it, the June 4 incident, as the Chinese call it, the Japanese provided them the fig leaf, they, uh, the diplomatic cover, and Japan was, the f on a direct request from Deng Xiaoping to Matsushita, invested heavily in, 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 in China when it was in the international doghouse uh, with the West. 
giving them an escape route. And that is, you know, uh, ASEAN also has been in this uh, in, in many ways. But the Malaysians helped the Burmese come into ASEAN, and they said they overlooked many of the nasty things that uh, the Burmese were doing. But even Lee Kuan Yew was hesitant to talk about uh, what he called an Asian model. And uh, in, in his interview to uh, Foreign Affairs, Farid Zakaria interviewed him in uh, 1994. He specifically says, look, there are cultural differences, but I don't see an Asian model as such. I'm not saying that these values are something to be resisted. In many cases, it's not uh, a negative thing. I mean, Burma changed largely because of uh, the EU sanctions, pressures. But if you look at the EU too, they've been fairly tactical about uh, their foreign po uh, policy statements, uh, although they tend to be very ideological. Uh, for instance, uh, on, on China's treatment of the Uyghurs, uh, at one point, they wanted to bring the issue to the UN Human Rights Council, but Greece objected because Greece was going to get, uh, uh, likely to be a big beneficiary of the Belt and Road. So, as Ambassador Krishnan said, if you really boil it down, Asian values come to, uh, what do they come to at the end of the day? There's a stress on hard work, on, as Ambassador said, educating your young. If you look at the Indian uh, uh, data on, uh, family income data and uh, where the discretionary income is spent, you'll see education is at the top of the list. Filial piety, love for family. Now these are really the Asian values that you could think about, but even these are changing significantly. So I should end here. Uh, by saying that even these Asian values that I just listed out are changing. Divorce rates are up. Homosexuality, the, see the Indian Supreme Court judgment and how it is resonating around the region. The work ethic is fading. In where I come from in Singapore, we joke that people will change jobs uh, just because your workplace is one bus stop closer to your home. Uh, you know, stress and frugal living is also weakening. And the digital world is bringing in changes that are very interesting, including uh, democratizing uh, thought and opinion. And as for democracy itself, which the West has been pushing on Asia in a big way, if you look around, except in Thailand, where there has been some regression, uh, there is a positive story to be told. If you look at Indonesia, if you look at Myanmar, if you look at Bangladesh, Pakistan, the uh, generals are back in the barracks. They're not, they're not fronting the show anymore. And finally, on climate change, which is a big issue that the West used to thrust on Asia until uh, Trump came along, but it's still a big issue with the European Union. This year, Singapore introduced the first ca carbon tax the first country in, in Asia to do that. China has one of the most impressive afforestation programs in the region. And at the macro level, the millennials are showing the way because of their sensitivity to climate. The result is that many companies, even banks, are changing their business models to, to, uh, to to take into account these pressures from the ground. So let me conclude by saying that every value system, whether it's uh, Western or Asian, has uh, universal aspirations. And these could be emphasized and promoted. But fraternity is easier when the identity and circumstances of the individual are respected. And that was the message that Donald Tusk got from General Sisi 
uh, in Egypt last week, which Ambassador Bhatia spoke about uh, yesterday. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Well, we've had three very stimulating uh, talks uh, on this topic um, and bringing together a number of threads from yesterday and looking a little bit further along to where we might be going on um, for the future of these issues. And who would like to start the discussion? I'm going to go around the, I'll go around the table actually with the hands. So, I will start with you. I'll, I'll go round. That'll be the easiest way for me to do it. So if we can start with you. Yes. Uh, with regard to uh, the universalization of another Western value that we are seeing in, in Asia. Now, this is uh, actually Neoplatonism. I mean, we talked of Don, uh, uh, the, uh, the pr uh, President of this thing, uh, America, yesterday, but he, he uh, Donald Trump didn't come suddenly. I mean, there was earlier on there was this wave of neo Neoplatonism or, or Neocons in, in, in America, uh, policy inspired by people like Leo Strauss in, in the University of Chicago, the Neocons, stopping ch social change, uh, uh, anti-democratic. Uh, pro-elitists. Uh, pro so these ideas were uh, those uh, were also behind the intervention in Iraq in many ways. Paul Wolf Wolfowitz and pe people like that. Today, today in Asia, and we discussed Southeast Asia, Far East, uh, and even parts of South Asia yesterday. What we are seeing is a, uh, is a, a increasing phenomena which lead me to think that there is a creeping universalization of Neoplatonism in this part of the world. That's because, okay, we have a single powerful political party, non-ideologically driven, emerging in many countries. You, you have a powerful military, powerful bureaucracy, non-elected advisors to government, and Plato's magistrates, philosopher kings. Uh, so, and a nanny state. Yesterday I spoke of the state's role in economic development. I mean, I'm beginning to uh, think, that, uh, no one thinks the same thesis the second day, but think through. So, are we also seeing a propagation of another Western ideal, or not an ideal quite in, in, a, in a very positive sense, because Plato has been called an enemy of open society by, by Karl Popper, even R.H.S. Crossman, and people like that, the, the left and, and, and right of of, of, of the Western uh, intellectual thinking. But are we seeing this growth of Neoplatonism, a nanny state, a state that is taken, uh, people taken care of by the state, uh, people not encouraged to ask too many questions, you have powerful individuals, men on horseback, philosopher kings running the society. So are we seeing this uh, growth of this kind of ideals in, in Asia? Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. I, I mean, I think with the empirical examples you were giving, you were sort of giving an answer to your own question. Um, I, know what to ask <laughs> so I, I suppose the question is, how enduring is this current pattern that we're seeing? Um, and I don't have an answer to that. I'm sort of hoping it's cyclical, that we will see um, a, a resistance and a reaction that will undo it. But I don't know. Um, I think Latin America is always an interesting place to look. Um, they seem to be ahead of the curve on interesting trends like this. Um, but there, the picture's not so encouraging either. So I don't know. It's, it's, I don't want to sort of risk a prediction. But wherever you find hegemonic practices, you also eventually find organized resistance. So perhaps the question is, how quickly will resistance organize? And um, I think the processes that help resistance to organize are also the ones where the state has quite a lot of surveillance and control. So it's very difficult to predict. No, I think that's a, a very interesting uh, observation. I think it's one that, uh, uh, that's vexing um, the West very greatly. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think uh, it's a topic much considered in Asia, but it's certainly very live topic in, in the West. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, as I mentioned in, uh, when Peter was speaking yesterday, I think that a lot of people 
um, attribute this, in fact, to neoliberal economic policies, mm -hmm. which have led to um, enormous disparities in um, social status. And um, I think that this has created an undercurrent uh, of disaffection, which uh, plays very neatly into the hands of uh, uh, politicians who want to rouse the, uh, their, the electorates with uh, hopes of a better future. Now, um, uh, this is, takes us to Pinkerty and the inequalities of, uh, of uh, society. And uh, no country, of course, is exempt from this. But um, are we going to see a complete change in economic ideology to address these problems of inequality? I think this is a very difficult uh, question because um, uh, the persons who have been elected uh, to such, uh, on, on the backs of such constituencies haven't really provided any answers themselves. Mm -hmm. So I think that on the one hand, as Kate says, this might be a transient feature. On the other hand, unless this uh, disaffection is addressed um, by new models of uh, economics and society, I think your, 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 I think your apprehension is correct. I think that um, this is only a trend that's going to grow, not only in the West, but perhaps in Asia too. In Asia, we've been more familiar with autocratic models, not least in your country, Iftikhar, uh, than, um, than the West has. And um, so perhaps we are more immune to, um, uh, to discontent with it. But um, I, I think that Ravi is exaggerated slightly when he says the wave of democracy is sweeping over Asia. Uh, there are various types of democracy and uh, we see them all in full flower uh, in Asia, from Myanmar to, uh, well, um, uh, to uh, Bangladesh, if I may say so, and India. So um, this is a model which obviously is in need of repair, but um, is it possible that a new model is going to emerge altogether? These are very important, very um, profound questions which, uh, of political science which need to be addressed, but I don't think Honestly, um, uh, anyone has the answer, and if they have answers, I'd be very happy to hear them. No, I just want to say that I didn't exactly say it's flourishing. What I meant was the general trend is a positive one uh, in these countries that I listed. Uh, particularly, uh, but in the case of Indonesia, I'd say it is flourishing, maybe not so much in Bangladesh, which uh, the last election was a bit of a... Um, uh, you know, <laughs> I don't know how to call it, but, uh, uh, but but Indonesia definitely is a it's it's been a standout uh, in terms of uh, democracy and uh, you know the uh, in, yeah I'll just leave that. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed all three papers, <clears throat> and uh, it's extremely challenging. But I do disagree with some of what you have to say. If what we are saying that it's true that we need to challenge the kind of messianic, imperialistic attempt to impose a prototype of some kind of Western values. But coming from Indonesia, you know my name is Dewi Fortuna Anwar, which is the legitimate Indonesian. Is this the Dewi of the Sanskrit? Or the Fortuna of the European? Or Anwar, the Arabic? The whole point is, like in Southeast Asia, there's no us and them. So I'm not very much in favor of returning to the debates of cultural relativism of the early 1990s, where we are Asian, we have different values, Western countries, liberal democracy and human rights are universal values are not applicable to us. Because I was, when I was working on my ASEAN thesis, I went around ASEAN countries. It's very, very different because values are contested between government and civil society. The governments are all saying, you know, we are, you know, we have to be Suharto, Mahati, Ali Kuan Yew saying, you know, we need order, we need to, to um, control politics in order to mobilize social economic development. And when you talk to civil society, they said, you know, I have no time for ASEAN because ASEAN are just sharing values of repressing their society. So these debates exist in each and every one of Asian countries as well. So I think we need to be much more nuanced uh, about this as well, as if, you know, there's just Asian countries, 
and Western countries and, and so on. And so I'm very happy, Kate, that you've quoted Amitabh Acharya, who has provided a much more nuanced argument that Asian countries have been carrying out acculturation all the time. I mean, whether it is the Hinduism or Buddhism and Islam and so on, you know, we have taken it in di different ways and also Western, Western influence. So uh, we need to unpack, to unpack the whole debates. Uh, I, I think that's just my call, you know. Clearly the call for greater uh, understandings of cultural differences, greater respect for, you know, multiculturalism and so on. But I do not want to empower authoritarian regimes by reviving this dead horse of cultural relativism. Thank you. I, 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 um, I don't think I, uh, I agree with you. That